welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of the All Unknowing Podcast. In this episode, Daniel and Peter discuss the glorification of mediocrity, mentorship, gratefulness, and self-accountability. Remember to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash theallunknowing, where we have exclusive content, collaborative discussions, and active community engagement. Now, join us as we jump into the unknown. So, you know, it, it, at the end of last episode, we started talking about the glorification of uh, mediocrity uh, within right. society and obviously very, very much focused on on the school system right now. Um, but, you know, also want to take a step back because it's as much about what happens at school is directly in, influenced by what's happening all around us. Right. It, it's, it's not like it lives on an island. Right. I mean, yeah. it is us. We are the school, essentially, like as human beings. So, well, and I think one thing, too is it, it's a feedback loop, right? Because then what happens in the schools feeds what's happening around us and so on and so forth. So it's a, a, a much more involved system than I think a lot of people think about in their day-to-day lives unless something major happens. Oh, without question. It, and, and I, but I think it's, it's so important to make that distinction because we, we can't view it as an entity that is in and of itself. Okay. Right. Like we yes. are again, like we're all part of it and it's, it's being shaped by everything that's, that's going on around us, you know, and um, th- there's a certain degree of empathic authoritarianism um, as, as I like to refer to it, that's happening there. Um, and it, it's because we don't want people to lose. Right. And yeah. I'm, I, I, I can understand where where someone would would perceive that, where where we might derive that, and, and it's it's the uh, it, it's it's Freudian at its base, right? Because it's um, the, the 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 whole Oedipal complex that builds off that that motherly instinct, essentially to to not let go, right? Mm. Like we 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 want to baby people, we don't want to see them fail. Like we're here to protect them, and that overprotectionism is what's not allowing them to flourish, essentially to become one into their own being. Right. Yeah. And and I think this is something that people need to dig into a lot. Personal lives as well as, uh, you know, influencing their local school systems by getting involved in however they need to. What is the definition of success? Because what what I believe it to be is vastly different than what a lot of the administrators in school believe it to be. Right. Uh, You know, as as we mentioned last time, I'm fortunate enough to be able to send my kids to private school. Right. Right. Okay. The assumption is that they're college bound. Is that an accurate assumption for 100% of their students? No, it's not. 99% probably, but there's always some kids who just aren't cut out for it, either by dint of their own particular talents and gifts or attitude or what have you, right? So if these kids decide, you know what, I'm going to go to trade school, I want to be an electrician, that's a failure in the eyes of the administration. In my eyes, that's a major success because at an early age, this young man, woman understand that, hey, college isn't for me. I still got to earn a living. This is a pretty good way to do it. And there's value in learning these types of skills, right? Yeah. So again, referencing back to our discussion from the last episode, how do we societally accurately or uh, correctly prepare these kids for one of the other paths, right? And then, all right, we get past this sort of bifurcation. We now have young adults who have no clue how to set a budget, how to balance a checkbook, so on and so forth. So in my proverbial example of the uh, of the electrician, sure, dude can go through trade school, end up being an apprentice journeyman master, and then maybe he wants to start his business, but he only has like a vague idea of what's involved with that, right? Potentially. I mean, I, I know from personal experience, that's not the case. These guys pick up a lot along the way in terms of bidding jobs and budgeting and all that. There's a whole process that's learned in in, in every craft, every trade, right? For sure. Right. So, okay. There's still the common denominator across all strata that you have to understand income is X expenses are Y X minus Y has to be greater than zero or you're screwed. Right. Right. And uh, this is also part of the, uh, the, the abject failure. And again, I think it goes back to the expectation of mediocrity. Because the whole thing is, let's just get the kids through school, pass test. At what point do you stop to step back and say, why are we putting these kids through school? And what happens at the end result? 
It's not my problem. They're out of high school at that point. See ya. Good luck. Right. And, and we can't have a, uh, we can't have that line of demarcation in there. And and, and, and and the goal can't just be like, let's get kids out of high school. I mean, it's it's a unit of measure, perhaps, for the general success of the school, which we yeah. can set aside for, 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 for a topic here and maybe later in the in this session. But True. it's it, it's beyond that. Um, it has to be beyond that. If we're only looking at what's right in front of our faces, we're not seeing what we're actually preparing these kids for. Like, you know, we're teaching them how to learn. That's what we should be doing. We're teaching them how society works, how we can all fit into this bigger picture, how we can collaborate and work together, that there's value in what people do outside of academia, right? The, the fact that these houses that we live in are built uh, by and large by people that will never go to college or have limited college experience but hopefully okay. know what they're doing and have learned their trade appropriately. Right. Exactly. And there's no precondition that they have to, that, that one needs to go to a, a, a particular university to be able to wire a house effectively yeah. as such that we can have this conversation right now. Right. Yeah, think about it. Right. <laughs> and again, like one, one of the things we all take for granted is especially the last three years, two, three years with the pandemic. Yeah. Everybody's been working from home. Dude, there were a lot of guys in bucket trucks over the last 30 years that made that possible. And sure. people forget that. Yeah, I I I I'm not going to go pull a wire. I mean, yeah. I, I I do I do I know how to do it? I, maybe. Um, yeah. am I going to go electrocute myself and have it done to code? No, I, I would rather have it done to code. Uh, and I'm gonna pay the electrician to do it. And yeah. you know what? Again, that's that's the beauty of the system that we live in, that that we can pick up the phone. And solve that problem because there are skilled craftsmen, tradesmen, et cetera. And it doesn't just stop with the electrician. I mean, this goes to no. all facets of society. And it and it, it's something that we have to think, we have to think bigger than than school and test score. We we need to think about how can we really enable each individual student, each individual person to 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 fill their the yeah. their best to, how do we draw the best out of them? How do we bring well, forth that potential? And and that's the tyranny of mediocrity, right? Exactly. The I think by and large, too many people are focused on this very narrow view of what it is to be a young adult in in the world today. I suspect that, again, we're talking about America primarily, but I I suspect if you go elsewhere in the world, there's going to be shades of gray on this exact same discussion. Right. So you now have somebody and going through whatever academic system it is and you're like, eh, you know, we don't want to overwhelm them. So let's cut back the amount of books that we read during the year. Let's cut back the amount of homework that we do because it's too much. I would argue it's too much garbage and not enough quality material. And that if you increased the quality material, the kids would respond. The problem by and large throughout all tiers of education is the lack of engagement by the student. Why? The students are much more capable today than they've ever been in spite of what everybody wants to say about back in my day, blah, 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 blah right? Untrue. More so because every kid out there, one way or another, either through his phone, through the Chromebook they get at school, through the library computers that are open use, all that type of stuff, has access to volumes of information that were inconceivable to previous generations, short of maybe advanced collegiate uh, degrees in uh, hard disciplines, meaning STEM and the like, right? Absolutely. So if that's the case, why are we limiting these kids by expecting so little of them? I don't think the answer is ever to lower the bar. I think it's to keep the bar at a very high level and then say, okay, kids, I know you can do this. Well, if you're having trouble, why? Then we address those deficiencies and get the uh, the kids who are having trouble meeting that bar up over it rather than lowering it and you know making it infantile coursework for, for everybody else. Uh, I, uh, I I looked at the MIT entrance exam from 1876, right? Okay. I I don't understand why you know today people are like, wow, that that's so hard. No, it's not. It should be the basic level of knowledge coming out today, a hundred years after that exam was written, that the average student should be able to do. Some of this stuff, admittedly, was a little was a little advanced. A lot of it is what I would consider high school level math. Um, yeah, so some, some of it might be like nuanced or specialized to to agreed. the purpose of that university, to the core concept of the university, or something like that. Yeah, but, agreed. Yeah, um, and, and and by and large, not everyone's a mathematician. I mean, I, I'm I'm going to sit here and make mistakes, and, and 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 it's going to happen. And you know, we all have our own stories and backgrounds, and I'm I'm more than happy to share that here in in, in a few minutes too. But I think that when when we when we set the bar higher, okay, 
And we're helping the students by identifying what the deficiencies are. And, and look, not everyone's going to be a mathematician. I don't need people to specialize in, in theoretical mathematics. Like that's not, that's not what the bar is. The bar here is that we're all learning to a certain degree, by and large, what it takes to, to be coherent members of, of this society that we live in. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. we can all participate together and that we all find our ways. Again, that we're drawing that potential. We're trying to draw the best forth from each individual student, the, the best that we can. Right, the best that we know how, and and again, if we're not doing that, it's a deficiency on us, and and we are we we will all suffer for it. Okay, it's easier to make a kid feel good by patting him on the head and giving him a cookie, correct, than it is to say, hey, you're not meeting the expectation that I have for you because I know you can do better. What's going on? That's let, true. Let, let, let's work on it so that you can do it because certainly you're capable. I guarantee you, kids will respond more to that because then they'll say, hey, all right. Teacher thinks I can do this. I know I can do it. I, I got to figure out why I'm having trouble. Yeah, and, and not everyone will have the the strongest of home backgrounds with, with parents that push them. Right. right? Yeah. I mean, I, I I've coached multiple sports uh, for for my kids, um, both in assistant and head capacities, and you know, I, I think that that's integral into understanding. Um, the, the, this concept of mediocrity, like we're, we're not handing out medals for everybody. Like there's no, right. you know, you, you know <laughs> consolation prize, so to speak. Um, yeah. We're aiming for something. And you know what, the kids, what, what, what I've learned is when you set a standard and you show them the way, okay. Yeah. The major, vast majority of them will respond positively to that. And that's just human nature. Okay. That's that, that's not something that we have to manufacture. People well, and, want and, and, they want that. And, and I think, you know, again, it, it's about building methodologies, right? Yes. So, you know, take any sport, football, right? All right. Or, or baseball to make it even easier. Okay. I was at bat five times during practice. I struck out three. All right. Let me do better. Next time I struck out twice and I got a foul ball. That's an improvement or a, yeah. a, a, a walk onto first base. Sure, right? sure, sure. You know, next time I actually got a first base hit on my own. So there's a progression. So, you know, is this kid going to the majors? No, but is he exercising control over his environment, working at a skill, whether or not it's a trivial skill is irrelevant. It still shows the discipline that, okay, if I put in the work, if I follow the process that coach tells me I need to follow to improve, I will improve. And all right, that's pretty cool. You know, now I can hit, I can hit the ball reliably and I get on base, you know, two times out of 10, rather than striking out 10 out of 10. Right. Uh, there's merit to that. Absolutely. And there's merit to adopting that approach across the board. I mean, as you said, not every kid's going to go to MIT. No kidding. Right. No. I mean, that's a that's a specialized set. Every kid absolutely should be able to do basic algebra. And I think the expectation is saying, well, you know, that's only for STEM fields is demeaning to all concerned where, yeah. you know, the the well-rounded student finishing, you know, secondary education should have a, a certain uh, cultural and intellectual vocabulary, which is in my mind, always, you know, math, science, history, uh, you know, sociology, uh, you know, even economy to a certain part, right. Have sure. the, have the understanding that this is how you fit in a broader spectrum of what we call society. And it isn't just good enough to get, you know, a C plus on your spelling test as you know, your final exam or whatever, you know, you want to pick for an example. Yes. And, and, and measuring in that way is not necessarily the most meaningful uh, yeah. end either. Right. So, I mean, I, I think some of the things that we've hit on thus far, it's like, you know, the, the school can't only be focused on getting as many kids see or higher out the door. Right. right. So I'm meeting whatever the standards are. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have, you know, and obviously here we have to have standards, Yeah, uh, but the standard has to be the expectation that we're actually developing children again towards their fullest potential so that they can go on to the paths that they will go on to in life. Right. Yeah. And I'm talking from elementary school through high school right now. Beyond. That, that, right. that is yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. And then beyond high school, when they leave that high school, when they leave those high school doors, um, that they, that they are in a position to understand what's, what's going on around them, that they can go and contribute immediately be it through trade or craft or any other job role. Because there are plenty of jobs that we need yeah. for plenty of varieties of skill sets and um, academic capability. Okay, and and, and again, it, it's a very small subset of people even that graduate that end up going and graduating from college, right? I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I can speak to that uh, prolifically. I mean, I, I, I graduated uh, in high school, 
sure. I graduated high school. And I tried college a few times and work out for me quite candid yeah, too. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and in some ways I've looked back at that and, and I thought, well, what happened? Um, I mean, I, I was, I, I grew up in Houston, Texas. I, I went to school there. Uh, what was it? Um, eighth grade, like towards the end of eighth grade, there's this academic assessment that high schoolers have to take in Texas. And I was, the teachers had me take it there uh, at the end of that time. Uh, early, like way early, they usually start testing kids in 10th grade. I passed the test like flawlessly. And, and they're like, so I'm like, okay, what do I need to do now? Can I just go to college or something? And they're like, no, you still have to go to school. I'm like, so obviously you, you could probably imagine what happened after that. Yeah, um, motivation. <laughs> yeah, I, I, went, I went from 4.0 student to like 2.6 by the time I graduated. Right. And yeah. it's because I like, I, I felt stuck there. Like there was no, there was no opportunity for me. And it, it, it kind of shaped me in, 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 in a bit of a darker way as I was, I'm, I'm an optimist. And some people might be able to tell that just by listening to me talk uh, about things. Right. And I still have that mindset today, but there, there was a period of time in my life where I was very much um, far more nihilistic perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think part of it's just because of my experience there. And, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but the the point is um, we have to we, we have to think bigger. Right. Well, but I, I think, you know, we, we should focus on that a little bit. Right. So what allowed you to change your thinking? You know, w- w- was there a particular event that was a, sort of like the uh, impetus to do it? Uh, somebody give you a piece of advice. What is it? Because this sort of thing, I think, is all too common. Yeah. Uh, again, we're talking the post high school crowd now. Yeah, right? post high. Yeah, absolutely. You're 20, 21, 22, 23 out in the world. And all right, you made some bad decisions, right? You're in a funk. How do you break out of that? And how do you get back on some type of constructive path? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say initially, my thought is I, I, I never gave up on trying to find my place in the world. Hmm. So there's that. Um, then no matter how um, how frustrated I might have become. I mean, you know, there, there were people that would hire, wouldn't hire me because I didn't have a college degree. There were other people that wouldn't hire me because they were like, you'll leave after a month because right. you know way more than us uh, about this. So um, and, and they probably were, were right, right. in thinking that, um, as, as much as I wanted a job at the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, also to that end, I've always found myself one, I, I've always maintained an ad- attitude of gratefulness, um, hmm. uh, of gratitude per se. And I'm, I'm honestly grateful just to be alive, uh, for the experience. Yeah. So, and, uh, well, there's a few times in my life that I can talk to where that was almost not the case. So I, I have some other, other perspective there as well. You know what I mean? So it's not, um, it's not unwarranted, I suppose, but I, I think about it as a, <clears throat> when you're going through something, you, 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 you can, you can seek out truth. I, I knew that I wasn't in the best of places mentally. I mean, I, I had kind of devolved pretty rapidly in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, it was this very nihilistic approach to if, if the abstraction of everything is, is worth nothing, essentially, then, then, then why, why does it matter? Why care? Right. Why? Yeah. And, and what, what, I had, what I had thought after a great deal of living life, just living and, and hopefully paying attention a little bit, was that uh, I woke up one day and said, you know what? This, this isn't for me. This is the wrong level of analysis. It's, it's the wrong level of abstraction. Like in, in any, I think any reasonably intelligent person can, can come up with that initial nihilistic conclusion. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I would say it's, it's, it's vastly and categorically wrong. So there's, there's two or three things that you said that I think are really, really worth highlighting. Right. So number one, perseverance, you stuck to it. Okay. Um, yeah. Life sucks, but it sucks now. It doesn't mean it's always yes. going to suck. So stick to I, it. I, I, I want to highlight that. I mean, I was like living in a trailer. Okay. Yeah. Like I was, I was very broke, very poor. Um, and most of it was my own doing, but the job be hundred percent honest. Like, right. So, uh, but yeah, please continue. I just, yeah. So, okay. But again, you, you had sort of like a, a moment to pause, reflect and realize th- this ain't happening. I, I got to get back on the, Correct. On, on the horse and keep riding. Right. Right. Okay. Well, you also uh, were able to to reach out to people around you, I'm, I'm sure, and say, hey, you know, what do you think? And take somebody else's advice and, right. and integrate it into, you know, what your thinking was. And, and in this case, change it, right? Yes. I, I, I had I've, I've, I've had a great network of friends that I'm, I'm again, very grateful for my, my entire life. Um, and one in particular out in Houston, I was living in Alabama at the time. 
and university wasn't working out for me. And I, again, I was in a very bad place and uh, mentally and yeah. it was self-consumed. It's this, um, it's a feedback loop, right? It goes on until you break it, until you step out of it. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he told me, I said, you know what, come here. I'll, I'll, and he supported me. He helped me. Um, he got me back out there, pulled, helped me kind of find myself out of that, out of that scenario. And I found a job actually working for HP on the Superdome systems at the time, mm-hmm. doing an engineering work on those, which was very fun. Yeah. I use those for two things, primarily for anybody who doesn't know what a Superdome is. It's this huge refrigerator server complex that they can chain multiple of them together. Um, and, and they were used for missile defense systems, targeting systems, and for processing telecommunications transactions as well. Yeah. All those things take up, uh, you know, millions to billions of calculations per second in real time. So, uh, but again, you mentioned this that I counted three times. Grateful, yeah. and I think this is a, a very good piece of advice for any young people that are maybe watching it, where it's it's a fine line, right? And I've I've said this to uh, numerous eh, teenagers, early twenties people that that I talk to, you know, based on my uh, my children's peer groups and some uh, activities that I uh, got involved with as well, right? Uh, People more likely than not are willing to mentor you, okay? But you have to realize the most valuable thing in existence is time. So if someone is taking their time to help you out, be appreciative of the fact. And don't assume that you can keep on going back to the well over and over and over, because now it goes from a mentor uh, situation to, wow, why are you pestering me? Get up off your ass and figure it out yourself, kid. I told you what I'm going to tell you, right? Yeah. yeah, If you can balance those two uh, somewhat opposite ends of the spectrum, I think that's the key. And then remembering people well past the event of aid, right? I mean, how nice is it when you get a call from somebody you haven't heard of in a while and you you hear, oh man, how you doing? Ah, You know, I was just thinking of you, blah, blah, nothing. Just calling up to shoot the breeze, to exchange pleasantries, a minor thing, but it's very meaningful, especially the older you get. Yes. When you start getting to the point in life where your friends start dying, right? So now all of a sudden, the guy that you uh, thought was always going to be there when you called up isn't. Well, as as time goes by, that happens more and more and more. So, you know, do you want to be the uh, the uh, lonely guy living alone in his room solely at the end of life, right? No, no, nobody wants that. But there, there's a way to avoid that if you stay engaged and observe the social graces which increasingly are fallen by the wayside and definitely are not taught in school today as they were when I was in school. So, I, I mean, that sounds like an old guy thing. I know, but the, I, I, the, I, I, there's I, a lot I, to be said for it. There is, there is a tremendous amount to be said for that. I mean, and even, even now I'm reflecting thoroughly about that time and it's, it's, I mean, I wouldn't be who I am today if it weren't for many, many people in my life. And that is not lost yeah. on me whatsoever. I mean, I agree. I feel the same. Yeah. And and from a it, it makes me emotional to think about, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's a bit overwhelming actually. But the I mean, what is it about that? I mean, they had a a high standard for me. Yeah. And I was pulled to that. Now I was I was I was certainly pointed that way. I would say pulled because I'm a, I'm pretty, I'm pr- pretty uh, stubborn, you know, but uh, w- once I got to the point where I could see the vision, I could see it. I was doing it. I was participating in it. I, I could see that path for myself and, and I could see that path for other people. And, and I think that's, that's something about humanity, right? That, that we want the best in other people. If we're doing it right, that's what we want. And, and right? this, this I think is the core of what has been lost along the way. How do you even have that thought in your head if along the way you haven't been exposed to great works of literature or philosophy or what have you, right? Yes. I, you, you literally cannot conceive of it because that thought has not ever entered your head because you're surrounded by a very negative environment. And this is true for far too many people at all strata of society. Well, if you can get to the point where, you know, you can start teaching these kids, hey, there's more than one way to look at the world. And step back and sort of take yourself out of the equation for all your personal uh, issues, good, bad, indifferent, and start thinking about it as part of a larger tapestry that affects far beyond wherever you are, right? So, you know, I mean, in in your example, yeah, you live in a trailer now, 
doesn't mean you're always going to be here. No, but no. I've, I've heard a lot of very defeatist uh, thinking in younger people, especially if they're going through a rough patch, which sadly far too many are, where they're like, oh, things are never going to change. Not kid, they, they, they will change if you want them to and if you work for it. I mean, you know, are, are you going to be, you know, rock star, movie star? No, nah, probably not. I mean, maybe, who knows? But that doesn't mean that you have to stop saying, hey, I really hate living in this crappy area. I hate having this crappy, you know, end of, end of the road job that's never going to go anywhere. I hate not having any skills. All of these are correctable problems, but you have to have the mentality to understand that they are correctable problems and that methodologies exist for you to overcome them. I, and, and this is, again, why I think this expectation of mediocrity that is, has been engendered over the last, I don't know, maybe 30, 35 years in school first and then society at, as a whole has come to really define things in a very negative way, in a limiting way. Uh, which is probably, in my opinion, the key thing that we have to address societally, at least in, in the U.S. and I suspect other countries would have I, similar I, I, I situations. As well. I mean, yeah. I, I think part of the problem there is this uh, this concept of ideological possession overwhelming the. It, it, it's creating a t- t- um, a totalitarian viewpoint of hmm. how that needs to be, that this mediocrity is the way, right? And it's it's the way to tyranny is honestly what it's the way to. Um, because if we can't, if, if, if we're not compelled to pull ourselves forward, to, to think, to want to help our fellow human being learn, um, you know, you know, again, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're doomed as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah, and I think that's a key point because now we're defining the intellectual vocabulary of yes. uh, our, our generation, multiple generations. And this is why I, I've always felt you know, George Orwell's 1984 is one of the, the most seminal works that should be studied at all levels in, in high school. Because uh, in, in a way, the, it, it was very much prescient of what, was, of what happened, uh, but he was limited in his uh, horrorful expectations of what would happen. And there's one key phrase in the book where um, the, the, the protagonist is having a, a discussion with somebody who's very proud about the amount of words that they've eliminated from the language. And that in another 10 years, we wouldn't even be able to have this conversation. And that's probably the most horrifying concept in the book, because if you eliminate words, you control thought. And if you control thought, you end up in a very bad place because it's limiting in and of itself. And it allows control of a lot of people unknowingly by a very small uh, minority that may or may not have nefarious purposes, right? It, it certainly allows for that level of control. And I think part of the, the comical nature about, you know, or, Orwell in general, I mean, if, if anybody knows about George Orwell, I mean, he was not exactly a conservative, uh, yeah. but here he is predicting all of these things. Very far from it. Exactly, exactly. And and so that, it, it's almost ironic in a way, but the, the humor isn't lost on me that even someone coming from that, that leftist, uh, you know, ultra liberal vantage point, seeing this happen, seeing it play out. I mean, it's, it's um, the, the really the point I'm trying to make there is it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. Like, you know, we, we, we have our own, we have our own issues. Um, and the problem is that we're focusing too much you know, on the fringes instead of focusing on what actually matters, yeah. um, which is what you and I are trying to bring forth. So you're very true. And, and an excellent point, because, uh, you know, again, you look at it from a, a basic uh, bell curve sort of thing, right? Yes. Bell curves, most everybody's somewhere in the middle, right? Within one standard deviation of the middle. And that will account for a large segment of whatever data set you're looking at. It's the ones at the end that are three, four, five, six standard deviations out that depending on you know what, what it is, you can ignore. And I think that's very relevant in the, the public discourse. But if you look at opinion polls, it's hysterical because generally... 25% will take an extreme position for something. 25% will take an extreme position against something. And the 50% in the middle can go either way. Right. Uh, and I, I think that isn't an accidental distribution. I think there's been an intentional manipulation of the educational systems to make sure that bell curve happens. Why? Because if you can control increasingly narrow segments of the 25% on either side of something, you can drive the discussion for the other 50% and give the illusion 
that there's broad based consensus on something when there really isn't. No, no. And, and I, I think I think there is absolutely something to that. And, and for, for those of you who are statisticians, he's referring to the Pareto uh, distribution. Yeah. So the uh, it, it, it's it's the. We could take that up for probably like four hours straight. It, it's it's not it's not a trivial issue, but yeah. I, I think that part of what's happening too, and there's there's a lot of times in my life where I was maybe a bit more unwilling to speak up, and True. not not like it, it's different, right? And I guess well, let me let me frame a little context for people that are listening. So. I, I will always do what I think is right. That that's my moral standing. Okay, and if if speaking up about something, if I feel compelled, call to action, I will certainly say it. But there's a certain degree of um, maybe it's better just to shut up because the consequences outweigh the potential benefit. And if there's too much of that going on, then I think we find ourselves in a bad place too. And I mean, even here, I'm talking about this glorification of, of, of mediocrity here because yes, you know, why now? Well, I, I think that's a valid question. Well, I think now is the time that, you know, even personally for me, I've decided that I can't watch this happen anymore yeah. because I see where it's going, right? And, and if I can see where it's going and I'm, I'm a human being living in this society and I'm grateful to be here, then I, sh- I should do something about it, okay? And if bringing awareness to it's the first step, then let, let's try to do that. So, and I think this is a, a very, very, salient area to to discuss we in the u.s and i imagine globally it's the same thing are in uh an inflection point in terms of demographics right yes the uh the largest generation in u.s history the baby boomers are dying off uh so now they're losing their power some of them are, are desperately holding on to it rather than accepting that hey the cycle is turning so we're having a lot of conflict in terms of as this group passes, who's going in to fill the vacuum and drive the agenda. And I think a lot of people don't view it that way and don't understand that this is one of the many things that are going on because, okay, we have new generations coming up. They're smaller, but because they're smaller, are they more easily radicalized one way or the other? Maybe, maybe not, but things are changing. And if you look at historical cycles, you know, the first quarter of a new century generally tends to be some sort of upheaval, right? At least certainly for the last two, 300 years, give or take, first and last quarters, right? So if this is what's going on, we are at the point where we can start setting what the social fabric will look like for the next 25, 50 years. And we have a chance to either do it right or blow it all to smithereens metaphorically and hopefully not literally, given the way things have been going in the last few months. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think people have to get engaged at this point and, you know, n- nothing dramatic. I mean, we're not talking about, uh, you know, setting fires on the streets and all that nonsense, right? That That's being manipulated by people who do not have the good of the, the populace as a whole in their hearts. Right. But on the, the little things, you know, you coach school teams, right? Give positive role models to these kids. If you see, you know, some young people that are having trouble, reach out, you know, what's going on. All right. You want to get involved? get involved in local politics, you know, local charities, whatever you can do. There's plenty there that can positively influence a large segment of people if, you know, they, they continue to be uh, uh, fed emotionally and uh, organizationally by, you know, well-meaning people who are thinking just beyond their own immediate self-interest. It, it, it has to start at the individual level, right? And, and you, yeah. you touched on this earlier, you know, in, in, our, in our previous discussion. It's if I can't fix my own world, if I can't fix myself and I can't drive in a, in a direction that I think that, that we, that we can agree on that, that is ideal, that we can move at least towards a direction of seeking truth and laying yeah. a foundation for us all to operate in the best way, to draw forth the best from that individual, whoever it may be. Mm-hmm. Right? That, that starts at the individual level. It starts at the community level. It starts in the family, right? And it yeah. moves up to the community and then it moves upwards. We, 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 we can't push it from the top down. And then that's kind of what that more uh, authoritarian mindset is. It's like, you have to think this way. You have to believe this. And if you don't, then you're the enemy, right? And, and, and yeah, that, and, that is the greatest threat to, 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 the, to this country and, and to the world. So. And I think that is the main struggle that's happening in higher education right now. Exactly. Right? 
Jeez. So, you know, you, you look with this cancel culture nonsense. Uh, I don't know. When I was at university, yeah, the university's always been leftist. That's just the nature of the institution. It's a progressive institution. It's going to lean that way, for right. sure. But having said that, you still could have a, a point counterpoint argument, and they may think you're you're an idiot, but at least you could have the discussion. Now, everybody is so afraid of their own intellectual frailty that they don't even want to have the discussion, and they will go through a, an essential cancel culture checklist, which I think we should talk about on, yeah, a, yeah. on another episode as to how to suppress any opinion that is contrary to whatever their particular worldview is. Yeah, that, that ideological nar- narrative. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, if you have to stomp on anybody who has something different to say than what you want to hear, really how strong are your convictions and how strong are the arguments that you use to base whatever agenda you have on, on case, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody wants to scream, ah, you're a Nazi, you're a Nazi. Okay, number one, you, you're throwing a, a word around that has very specific, very serious limitations. Just because, or, or connotations, excuse me. Absolutely. Just because you disagree with somebody, you don't call them a Nazi. You know, I mean, unless they are a Nazi. But, sure. I mean, you it, know, it, few it, and far it, between. It might, yes, it might work, but probably is, is not the right term that we should be using, right? We shouldn't be classifying right. people in that context. Right. And, and, and we could, we could, you know, we could deep dive in that too, but I, I don't think it's worth it here. The, the idea is that if we, on this show, right, we don't attack people. We're not calling out names. We're not calling out, uh, yeah. it, it, it's, it's not about the person, what we're attacking here, what we're going after are ideas concepts yeah. things that we modes can of thinking modes of thinking things that we can pull out and and fix or make real or point in a better direction orient in a better direction that's all that that's what we're about here it's not about the individual and it never will be because guess what it, it could be any of us right ah, so. but so now all right we enter into much more nuanced in-depth discussions if this approach is followed right once upon a time this used to be in the public sphere whether it be evening news the you know hard magazine shows which, you know, 2020 was at one point, 60 Minutes was at one point, right? The whole idea those shows existed to do this in-depth analysis of, you know, political world affairs, what have you, right? Mm-hmm. What 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 is all this stuff turned into? It's all glad handing and in, in intellectual masturbation, right? There's nothing that ever is seriously discussed in these shows. It has the veneer of severity, the veneer of gravitas. Yes. But at the end, somebody behind the scene is writing very poor propaganda and it's very interesting to me that so few people realize that that's what's going on. Um, I, I don't want to get into politics because that's not really the focus here. But uh, my my most notable complaint about this is all the Ukraine coverage. And I literally mean all of it. It doesn't matter what side you're on in terms of whether you think, um, you know, one side or the other is right or wrong. It's any argument that's presented to support it. It's very, very poorly thought out, in, in my opinion. And a lot of facts are omitted across the board. Why? Somebody has an agenda they're going to promote. And that agenda is not the benefit of stopping a war that never should have started in the first place. I I, I don't disagree with that. I think that, but it, it, it's part of pulling forth these things. And, and we're right. hitting on topics here that become the manifestations of, of, of human nature when when, when we're not orienting ourselves in, 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 in a better way, perhaps we're more, what I don't want to see happen in this country and anywhere in the world really is that we, we delve into a realm of mediocrity. Ultimately, yeah. I mean, we're certainly on the path there because look at all the great things that have happened in, in, in society over the past hundred or 200 years. Yeah. Um, magnificent things and they're not happening because we we sit around and stare at the wall all day the, yeah. because because it's easier to feel happy than it is to to try hard right um you know it, we we can't be you know we shouldn't be lost to the idea that living is actually difficult true right uh, and i'm and, not and just let's talking not minimize about, that either you know no, for, and i think that gets lost yeah because I can go to the grocery store and buy food and someone's there and they'll stock it. And well, you know, I don't even have to worry about that. Right. It's just it just exists it, when I go there and I buy it. And, when and it let's pause to think about what 
an incredible development that is in terms of human history. Yes. Because up until, I don't know, a hundred years ago, that concept did not exist. Yes. People had to toil the, in the soil to grow their own food, to preserve it, so on and so forth. And only the extreme wealthy did not have to worry about that. And in this case, what we're not even difference. talking about what we would perceive as wealthy. We're talking about hereditary aristocracy. Yes. So we're extremely, extremely blessed to be living in a situation in a time and place where medicine is available, food is available a- anywhere that we want. And, you know, people will complain, oh, I can't afford it, this, that, and the other. No, there's a way, right? Uh, in, in the United States of America, no, nobody should go hungry. And if they are, we have a major problem. Other parts of the world, different story. But, you know, again, we're, we're talking U.S. And, you know, same thing for healthcare. People say, oh, I can't afford healthcare. Yeah, you can. You know, we, we just need to make people aware of how to do it. And again, expectations of mediocrity, right? How do kids finish school not knowing this stuff? It right? can't be good enough. That's the problem. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, we cannot have a state where, where we are good enough. And if, again, if the, 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 really the focal point here is that we have to be pushing towards yeah. that, that state. You know, I mean, to, to, to sit here and think that mediocrity is going to, to get us anywhere that we need to be, that we're going to, that our lives are going to get easier, that all of a sudden that we are, we're going to be the, the, the benefit of, of what, of, of mediocrity. Like who, who wants that? Who, who watches the worst sports team on TV at night, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was watching an NHL game last night. Okay. Like those are the, some of the best players in the world, obviously. Right. Um, why was I watching that? Because it's competitive. It's interesting. Those are some of the best players in the world. Like yeah. it's, it's the pinnacle of the sport. <laughs> well, what's the pinnacle of, 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 of the sport of, 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 of the society. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's us all drawing the best out of each other. It's, it's us raising the bar. It's us pushing one another not to fail. Right. But, but, but to be the best versions of ourselves. Well, and, and again, this is inherent, I think, to the American character. Why does everybody in the world want to come here? Right. Uh, you know, I, I personally met somebody in the early 90s when I was in California, a uh, Guatemalan guy yeah. who or excuse me, El, El Salvadoran. Uh, he literally walked 800 miles from his home to the U.S. to get away from the civil war that was raging at the time. Right. And I mean, number one, wow, what, what a statement to this guy's character that he, he, he had that dedication and and the, the guts to do it. And, you know, the constitution of a 17 year old. But even at that young age, right, I, I, I'm going to die if I stay here. An extreme example. I want something better. So I'm going to walk 800 miles to the point where he wore out. I forgot. I think he told me like a half dozen pairs of shoes. But along the way, walking barefoot, he encountered the kindness of strangers who would say, what are you doing? Uh, I'm leaving El Salvador. I'm going to the U.S. Well, you can't do it barefoot, kid. Have some shoes, right? So uh, the, the fact that people want to come here then, now, and in the future is because we have a society that does not tolerate mediocrity, that says, hey, you can be the best that you want. You got to work for it, though, pal. And this is the, the message that's getting diluted. Uh, again, I think it's part of a, a concentrated agenda to engender helplessness in a populace to say, well, you know, life's too hard. Don't worry about it. It sucks for everybody. Yeah. Hmm. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Right. Un- unacceptable. That That is not how this country was built. It's not what made it great. It's not why my father came here. Right. It was always to say, what do you want to do? OK, go do it. And he did it. Generations have done it before and since. And hopefully we'll continue to do it. Uh, but only if I th- personally, I think if we insist on the best. If we insist on the best schools, if we insist on the best healthcare, if we insist on uh, the best transportation systems, the best utility grids, I, you know, th- this is what differentiates us from a lot of parts of the world. I uh, absolutely do not take indoor plumbing for granted, having visited my father's village, right? You know, God bless plumbers, man. That's all I'm saying. Hey, man, that, 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 that's that, that saved many lives. Many, many right? Lives. Right. And, and OK, even beyond, you know, the, the kind of tongue in cheek joke. Right. You know, what, what does it mean systematically that we have clean water available every time you turn on the tap? That's a miracle. Right. I, or that, you know, we don't have to worry about cholera and dysentery in this country. Other countries really have this concern, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Right. Yes. Uh, th- th- this is a major accomplishment. And it didn't get 
uh, to the point we are by people like just shrugging and saying good enough. No, somebody said, that's good. I can make it better. Let's make it better to the benefit of all. I mean, why do we pay taxes, right? That's why we have this expectation that we live in a first world country. We should have first world standard of living. And uh, I'm, I'm refused to entertain all this stuff about how it's disruptive and, you know, long-term uh, genocide, blah, 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 blah. No, I, I don't buy that. And anybody who says that hasn't experienced the alternative. Yeah, you're absolutely correct there. And if they have, they were, I don't, I don't know, um, unable to perceive in some fathomable yeah. way. Um, but we, life is what we make it. Yeah. Right. So if, if, if we, if we let the bar be low and then that's what we want as individual people, I mean, do you wake up in the morning and think I want to be the, the most terrible uh, plumber in the world? Do, no. do you not have a standard? If, if I'm going to school in the morning, it's, you know, what can right. I learn today? Right. Yeah. Like what will I learn? Can I activate that, that, that mode of thought? Can I, can I bring that, that desire, that, that, that will out of, out of the individual towards, towards that positive uh, achievement here. I mean, I, I, I know the yeah. answer is yes, but we, we can't, we can't forget that it's, it's with each one of us. Right. Right. It, the, it lays with every individual person. Right. And, and again, I mean, I, I had a, a conversation with a, a good friend of mine who was dying of stage four cancer many years ago and uh, he was in his early thirties and, you know, we had come to that conclusion collectively through that, through that conversation. It was like, you, you, you can't change it. There's immutable qualities that we all have. Like we, we can't change many things about us or our existence or the time that we were born or where we live or how we're living, but we can, we can change how we're living. We can change the choices that we make every day. And, and again, life is absolutely what we make it individually and as a collective here as a whole. Right. On that note, I think that's a good place to break. Daniel, right. thank you. As always, stimulating, excellent conversation. Yes, Peter. Thank you for your time, sir. And I look forward to uh, continuing the conversations. Yep. Next episode.